and hi everyone, it's really good to be here. I'm really excited about what, um, I'll stand up here. Um, it's non-hierarchical. I, I don't feel good about that. I'm gonna start here. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm really excited about what Minds at Work are doing and when we had a first chat with April and Sarah, it was like a real um, click. So I'm really excited for this talk and this event. Here I am, for you to go. So I'm going to talk about designing organizations to be more human. And obviously that's now, I feel like that's a phrase that's kind of thrown around quite a lot now, especially with the whole AI technology thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and define that a bit more closely uh, in my talk. Um, so. I've put this picture of what I would think of as millennials here. Um, I am a millennial and proud. Um, and, and I would say the future is calling for new ways of working. And partly when I'm asked to give these talks about the future of work, I originally never mentioned like my age or being a millennial. It was like really not um, something that I wanted to bring up. But then when thinking about like what is the future of work, obviously the future of work is going to be defined by the people who are coming up. It's about the rising generation. And I feel like millennials have got a bit of a bad press. Um, you know, we, I think we're described as kind of like quite stubborn. We have the, you know, we, we're very clear on what we want. We're not afraid to walk away. As someone mentioned, we're kind of hopping from job to job. We're quite like um, demanding. Like, and, and actually, I just want to make the argument that actually we need demanding millennials because millennials want a whole range of things that I think actually a lot of us want, especially avocados. <laughs> Millennial, you know, when I, what I hear my generation say is they want agency, they want flexibility, they want exotic vegetables, they want professional development, learning, autonomy, and, and they want work to be purpose-driven. Um, they want to work on meaningful projects. And actually, it's, there's, there's a study, out, I'm very bad at citing my studies, I, I need to get better at this, but there is a study that I saw at one point <laughs> that said that nine out of ten uh, millennials report wanting uh, to like needing something beyond financial success in their work um, and I actually I work with a lot of people in this kind of future of work space and many of them are actually in their 40s 50s and 60s and I've heard many people describe themselves as a 50 year old millennial or a 60 year old millennial because these are things all of us want in our work. I think all of us want to be free. All of us want to be learning. We want autonomy. I think these are common human needs. And I think I'm proud to be a millennial kind of demanding these things for everyone. Um, so this is, this is a, a, a kind of <laughs> quote from a book that, that has really influenced my thinking. It's called Dying for a Paycheck. Uh, it's by Jeffrey... Pfeffer. Pfeffer, exactly. Um, and that, you know, this, this looks like quite an extreme slide, but what he's, what he's arguing is actually looking at, at like at disease and stress and the kind of illness that's actually caused by the way we do our work and the kind of way we do management. This is not an extreme statement. The workplace is killing people and nobody cares. There are some really shocking statistics, something like, again, my statistics are not, <laughs> not cited, but I, I've read somewhere that 7% of people are reported to be hospitalized during their working life due to illnesses that are caused by stress at work. You'll have 50% of people in the workforce take time off work due to stress related to work as well. Uh, and people obviously are leaving, you know, people leave work due to stress. There's a massive uh, problem with kind of talent leaving and many, you know, many millennials are actually just not even entering the main, mainstream workforce. Um, this is a very, you know, this is actually a stat that many people know. It's this Gallup figure of roughly 70% of people. Somebody mentioned this about disengagement of work. So 70% of people are disengaged at work. Given that work is actually where we spend our 80,000 hours as human beings, 80,000 working hours, you could think of that as like the sum total of your human potential in your lifetime. And this is being spent in organizations. Many, for many of us. So the way I see organizations are a little bit like the stewards of human potential. It's a massive responsibility. And, in, you know, and then we're creating workplaces that actually have the vast majority of people disengaged. And then this, little, <laughs> this lovely little segment here who are actively disengaged. So that's not just disengaged, that's actually toxic kind of sabotaging the outcomes of work because people feel so frustrated and, and not seen and not heard and actually kind of rebel against their workplace. Add on top of this, this is a whole bunch of things I'm kind of weaving together here. Add on top of this that when we look at the kind of the rate of, of 
growth of the workforce, you can see that actually now freelancers are, the, the rate of growth of freelancers is higher than the kind of growth of the, of the mainstream workforce. So, you know, pl platform, this is due to a lot of different, different reasons, you know, one, some of them are the kind of state of the workplace. Another is that technology is really in, enabling this. So you've got kind of the internet, tech platforms, blockchain, which is really reducing the kind of transaction costs of people finding work and, and kind of enabling trust between people who have never met each other before. I think I read somewhere that by 2030, it's predicted that kind of the majority of people will be in the gig economy or working freelance. So the world of work is really, really changing. And actually, organizations have to up their game if they want to stay relevant in the future. By 2030, what will an organi organization look like if actually majority of people aren't, aren't working in kind of static organizations? So my argument is that the organization of the future is, is something I call horizontal. It's networked and it's human. And I think these things can really work together um, to make kind of organizations of the future where people who are millennials and of all ages can really thrive do what they want, have freedom, have autonomy, but also receive the kind of support, the peer learning, peer mentorship, and actually, you know, management that they need to do their best work. I have been on a bit of a journey in the last two, three years of, of spending time with very radical organizations at the very edge of experimenting with these very, with, yeah, with strange ways of, different ways of doing work, so new ways of working. Um, I've, I've spent time with people who, kind of self-set their salaries and Percolab, they work together, all of the salaries, all of the finances are completely transparent. Um, you know, they, they decide on how much everyone should earn, they engage in conversation. And that's been, you know, these places are kind of, I see them as the laboratories at the edge of experimentation. It's not necessarily how all of our workplaces should be, but it's kind of like, it, I feel grateful that there are these places that are actually doing these experiments that are really, really hard work in terms of personal development, in terms of like stre stress, like the stress of actually talking about money with your colleagues. It's like something that is not, it's not commonly done. It's not, you don't talk about your salary. In fact, in, you know, put your hand up if you actually know how much your colleagues in your company earn. I'd be curious to know. I mean, that is... It's like very few, very few people. It's like, I'm surprised there's, you know, there's a couple of hands. I mean, obviously, depends on where you are in the organization, which comes into this whole, this whole horizontal part, which I'm going to come into in a second. Uh, DGov Foundation is focused on something called distributed governance. I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus less on that, but that's essentially the technology side of how can we build systems for kind of even tens of thousands, if not millions of people to make decisions together globally. So we could, I mean, the kind of utopian dream of, of DGov Foundation is to create the kind of infrastructure for um, the planet to make decisions together. Like, do we want to keep surviving? Yes, that would be good to know, <laughs> I would argue. Um, and, and then Inspiral is a, is a really exciting kind of innovative, network uh, that's been practicing decentralized ways of organizing for the last decade. Um, and a lot of these practices when you know, I'm now working with organizations to bring these practices in, not in kind of full transform the whole organization into a non hierarchical, chaotic free network. But actually, there are some really interesting practices and ways of working and ways of being that we can learn from these really pioneering innovators um, and, and bring into the mainstream world. Um, just a little bit here because I know you've mentioned that I'm a, uh, well, you, meant, you were going to mention at some point that I'm a, I have a background as a scientist. So, you know, when we look at nature, I'm sure this, many people have kind of have heard of these things before, but nature organizes in very different ways to the ways we organize in our companies. And there's a lot we can learn from how neurons kind of structure themselves and, and organize. Bees practice all sorts of kind of democracy done with dancing. Not sure how that would go down, but... You know, there's, there's a lot to learn there. So bees, neurons, swarms, like nature and, and life organizes in all sorts of different ways. And I feel like we're being really uncreative and unimaginative in, in kind of being stuck in these pyramid-like structures. Um, nature often, you know, when you, as a biologist, life evolves to optimize uh, for, for kind of continuing to survive and to live. Um, and so kind of organizing in these networked ways and organizing in these like non-hierarchical ways, what it does is it actually decentralizes power because actually the, the people or the units of, of kind of 
the beings that will, will have most information about kind of conditions on the ground are those that are actually on the ground. It seems completely bizarre that actually the person making the biggest decisions in an organization would be someone who's really removed from what's happening on the ground. So there's a lot of wisdom in natural systems that we can also look to. I just thought I'd mention here, um, yeah, on this, on this kind of journey that I've been on, I've come across a lot of really exciting organizations, larger organizations that are practicing um, very radical ways of organizing. And Valve is a, quite a well-known games company that's actually making, it's got like a massive turnover, extremely successful company. And this is, this is their organizational chart. So it's just like total chaos and freedom. Um, and there's basically no structure. There's no kind of management structure at all. You enter and you just have to work everything out and learn from your peers as you go. It's a kind of self-organizing system. Um, something else I remember from Valve is that they, they kind of give employees desks on wheels. So they're, they're all, and, and they can track each other's desks. So they're kind of, they've got their computers and they're like, okay, I'm gonna go and work with Bob and then I'm gonna go and work with, with Sarah. And then you can have your little chart and you can see where all the other desks are. So it's like this really interesting collective intelligence of like, you know, you can, you can see this kind of fluid dynamic way of organizing in real life. Um, and clearly it's working for them because it's, it's a very successful company. And you can look up, they've, uh, they published their handbook online. So if you just type into Google Valve handbook, you can download their, their employee handbook. And it's, it's really funny because it's, it's um, yeah, illustrated and quite hilarious as well. Um, so I, yeah, the way I describe my work at the moment is, I, I think we think of architecture of buildings. It's very easy to think of architecture of how we build kind of physical property and how we, how we architect buildings to work for humans. But we don't think very much about how we kind of architect this invisible human material, like this, this, this way of working. Like we, we just kind of, when, when people build companies, when people build startups, there's a, there's a very much like a um, set menu of like, okay, well, it's a company, so we're gonna have managers, we're gonna have a founder, CEO, this is how it's done. But I think this next era, especially as organizations are gonna need to start competing with these networks and because of these technologies that I mentioned, it's kind of exciting to me to think about, you know, what, what could like a job in the future of like human architect look like? Like actually architecting these different practices in a company, these different ways of organizing. And there's, there's really like a limitless way of, of deciding how to, how to kind of structure your business, whether that's in terms of governance and management or in the more invisible things like practices, like how do you welcome your employees on a Monday morning? These are things that need to be thought about beyond just HR. This is actually how, this is experience design. And actually, you know, I would argue that humans and the human experience is, the, is a company's biggest asset if you're thinking long term. So it's important, important stuff. So to kind of loop back round to what I was talking about at the beginning of this, all of this psychological stress and, and kind of impact on people's health, I would argue that the, the major sources of psychological stress at work are actually connected to old school hierarchical culture. So kind of vertical, hierarchical, vertical culture, top down, people telling each other what to do in a chain of kind of control. Um, if you think about, you know, people, people report um, sources of stress at work being things like, you know, not feeling recognized or having work kind of stole, you know, taken by, by people further up in management, um, feeling like a lack of autonomy, not having freedom of choice, all of, the, all of the kind of, the list of things that millennials like, apart from avocados. Um, yeah, the, having, not having those are, are a major source of stress. Um, and and the, what I call this vertical culture of like, of, you know, the way we, we structure organizations which was created in, for a kind of industrial age, we grow up in, in kind of vertical ways of working and being, like at school. We're actually, most schools are very hierarchical. And it's, I kind of have this picture of a fish in water because we can't see it, it's invisible. We grow up in families, many of our families are very hierarchical. We go to school, we're told to sit down, do what we're told, you know, not to copy each other. You know, even just that in itself, is, it's like anti-collaboration. We're introduced to these anti-patterns of collaboration at a really young age. Um, and we're, we're kind of trained to look up to a leader or somebody in control to kind of tell us what to do. 
um, and this, this kind of quenches creativity. Um, so, okay, so what is, what is a human organization? What is a horizontal organization? What are these terms and how do they, how do they relate? Um, so I've kind of listed some of these ingredients that during this, this time of working with organizations at, this, at the edge of innovating this stuff I've seen. So organizations with trust, organizations that allow you to be flexible, entrepreneurial. You know, a lot of people today have talked about well-being. Um, and then, you know, more things that we talk less about, like power is shared, things are transparent, um, especially around money. That's something, that's a pattern that I see in most organizations I work with, that there's a real taboo around talking about money. And, and yeah, to actually be able to open up a system and talk about, transparency is very important for kind of living systems, as well as human systems, to be able to arrange in these collective intelligence ways. So then from, I would argue that horizontal organizations are more human. Uh, just to go through these, these are, these are probably some uh, characteristics that many of you will perhaps recognize or, or resonate with. In a kind of vertical culture, we have a top-down way of, of managing, top-down way of organizing, moving to a horizontal kind of participatory way, really bringing people in and actually harnessing the kind of human potential that you have in your team. So moving again from coercive control, you know, actually people, managers kind of forcing or you know, coercing um, people on their teams to do things, we move into more of a proposal mindset. So invitational, actually inviting people in, inviting people to do things, really setting purpose as a clear thing. Moving from blame culture, kind of adult child dynamics in a, in a psychological sense to adult adult culture, uh, actually trying to develop a culture of mutual respect and fellowship. Um, moving from secretive to, again, what we call default to open. So in most organizations, the, the culture is one of kind of default to close. If, if there's no reason to share something, actually we'll default to keeping it private, especially from competitors. And obviously it's obvious why this has developed, things like IP, you know, a lot of competitive advantage is based on um, keeping things secret and private. But actually moving into a horizontal way of working demands that we default to open and actually share information and that allows the system as a whole to work better. Um, moving from a kind of permission needed, looking for permission in this adult child dynamic to, to proposals, um, moving from hiding mistakes to mistakes being a source of learning. So also horizontal organizations by default are learning organizations. And yeah, I, this is kind of core, moving from competitive culture to viewing colleagues as, as humans deserving respect and support and into more of a, a kind of collaborative way of working. Um, and so how do we move from these kind of, these are all quite, these sound great, but they are all quite abstract. So it's like, oh, it would be great to live in a, to be in a transparent organization, one that's horizontal, one that, you know, people have agency. But the real, where the rubber, I feel, really, really hits the, what's that phrase? The, the road? the road. I should never do phrases because I always forget. I'm like, Where the rubber hits the road um, is actually translating this, this stuff, this kind of utopian vision of an organization of the future to how you actually do that even tomorrow. Like how do we do, how do we put these things into action? And the, the answer to that is practice. So I'm really, really big on practice at the moment. When we, practice is, I mean, you all know what practice is, but I would define a practice is something that you kind of come back to again and again. You consciously make space or time for learning and you spend time on reflecting on, on where you're doing with your learning. Um, somebody, an organization I was working with in New Zealand, it was the, they, I was working with this team and um, one of the guys on the team had this real kind of light bulb moment because I was talking, talking about practice and he was suddenly like, oh, it's kind of like yoga. Like you, you wouldn't start doing yoga once you've already hurt your back. You actually do, you practice yoga as a, as a way to be ready for, for when kind of disasters happen or, or like problems arise. So by starting to practice early, we can actually start to shift the whole culture of an organization before things go wrong, before you actually run into, into problems. Um, I've just listed, I I'd love to go through um, some of the practices that we work with on the ground, but yeah, that would, that would be a much longer talk. But I've listed just a couple of them here. And actually, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm just into 20 minutes, but I'm keen to, to just do a very quick practice, actually, with you all. Um, 
just to list a couple of them here, yeah, we work with organizations to make finances transparent, clearly stating purpose. It's really, really simple. A lot of these practices are extremely simple, but many small practices are, are what lead to a kind of shifted culture. Using a new decision-making method with your team. I mean, even just having the awareness that there are different ways of making decisions instead of just one person making a decision or a group of people in a room going round and round in circles for, you know, for, for hours on trying to make a decision. There are really interesting kind of new architectures of decision making, things like sociocracy, consent-based decision making instead of consensus, advice process. These are, these are things that we're not taught in school not taught in kind of business school either, but there's actually a wealth of different ways of organizing and making decisions and kind of, um, yeah, move, do, organizing our human potential. It's really exciting. Even something like in meetings, you know, I, I've put here rotating the facilitator, but actually just having a facilitator in meetings is already like a massive first thing just to stop that same person always talking and taking up all the space. Like there are really kind of subtle and, and interesting practices you can introduce that can just very subtly shift power and create space for, for kind of collective intelligence to emerge. So this is a body of work that I work with. It's called Going, Going Horizontal. And I work with a woman, Samantha Slade, who, who has just written this book this year. Uh, it's a manual for people who want to start practicing more horizontal ways and you can kind of start tomorrow because a lot of these practices are personal practices. They don't even require other people. Just like uh, Mo was talking about that actually to create more happy organizations, you need people just modeling happiness. You don't need to ask for permission or you know, have a team meeting to decide on whether you're going to start modeling happiness. You can just do that. So there's a lot of, it's really exciting to me, like working with this kind of work of practices, because actually employees and people in the organization, you don't need permission from hierarchy to start organizing in non-hierarchical ways. So these are our seven domains of practice, autonomy. It's, it's just a way of organizing all of the different kind of methodologies and practices that we work with. So it starts with autonomy. Autonomy is, is the kind of foundation that horizontal culture is built on. From there, we move to purpose, kind of clearly defining purpose, really, really simple, really obvious, but actually at the beginning of a meeting, just saying, okay, so the, the purpose of this meeting is X. Now everyone's on the same page and you actually have a less hierarchical situation because everybody's given a chance to contribute. Then meetings is a really big one. I mean, meetings are almost like the kind of the, the warrior training ground of, of more horizontal, non-hierarchical ways. Like the way meetings are usually run just very, yeah, like of, often kind of one person arriving, there's no agenda, one person, one person kind of doing all the talking, same, say, no facilitation, same voices every time, um, you know, timekeeping, you know, meetings overrunning, like there are very simple ways of making meetings more efficient and more um, kind of inclusive and, and conducive to collective intelligence. Transparency, so that we've talked a bit about that defaulting to open, decision-making, being aware of different forms of decision-making, kind of having a, a landscape of how decisions are made in your organization, learning and development, and the really thorny one, which is kind of conflicts and relationships. Because often we see conflicts in an organization as things between two people, so kind of interpersonal conflict. But actually, if we shift to seeing that as a systemic problem, if there's a conflict, you can see that as kind of a, a horizontal, like systemic symptom of something that's going on in the organization. So very, very quick practice. I'm going to ask you, we're going to focus on transparency. And I'm going to invite you to just turn to the person next to you and just tell that person how much you paid for your shoes. I'm going to give you like 10 seconds. Enough talking, enough talking about your shoes. Enough. It wasn't meant to be that fun. <laughs> okay. Okay. So second round. Second round is an invitation. This is basically kind of demonstrating or practicing the uncomfortable sense of transparency and actually experiencing what, what that kind of sharing um, gives rise to. So the second round, second level, is uh, if you want to and you don't have to, sharing the, the number that you pay for rent per month or the amount that you paid for your house, if you want to. This is getting more edgy now. 